Good morning. And welcome as we gather on this fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. Our opening hymn is number 622, Your Hands, O Christ. worship today is a version of Psalm 111 and we can be found at Voices United 833. I will thank you, God, with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in their assembly. Honored Majesty, are your work, your righteousness endures forever. those who fear you, you keep your covenant always in mind. The works of your hands are faithful and just, all your precepts trustworthy. You sent redemption to your people. God is the beginning of wisdom.
Let us bow together in our opening prayer. Holy and awesome God, your Son's authority is found in integrity and living truth, not the assertion of power over others. Open our imaginations to new dimensions of your love, and heal us of all that severs us from you and one another, that we may grow into the vision you unfold before us. And let us continue in prayer as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you. In the life and work of the church, firstly a reminder that we are being broadcast or podcast through Niagara Online Worship, and John is up there taking pictures of the back of your heads. This week's bulletins are sponsored by Bob and Glenda Doan in celebration of the birth of their grandson, Reed Craig Scott Medvin, little brother for Isla. Okay. Now, birthdays. Phyllis Booth, you're getting older again. Seems to happen once a year. 
And Josh McMahon, we don't see Josh around uh, much, but he's moved off to Toronto and uh, doing well, I understand. Sandy, are you coming next week? Me? Yeah. Um, I maybe have some. <laughs> we'll sing to you today. Okay? <laughs> Any others? Okay, let's sing. get into next week already. Okay. Next week is a, a passage of some sorts. We've been long awaiting our outreach minister and uh, Bill will be starting this coming week and you'll be able to uh, meet him, although I think most have already. Uh, you'll be able to meet him next week. But next week I'll be more of an MC. Um, at both places. Bill is going to be preaching down at uh, Ridgeway and uh, Brian Brown, who's with us, will be uh, preaching here. And he brought his better-looking half with him, so we welcome Jenny too. Um, so that's happening and there will be, we're having finger foods, aren't we? It's, uh, oh, it's a potluck, okay. So we're having a potluck. Um, and during that time of uh, fellowship, you'll get to uh, meet Bill if you haven't already or reacquaint with him. I should mention too, um, last week the Presbytery had a pulpit exchange and so I bring greetings from Jordan Station United Church, which is where I was, and I thank you for welcoming Anita Stiller here. She enjoyed her time uh, in your midst, and uh, did you make her pay for the the mission lunch or not? She paid. She paid. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. She left a gift. She left okay. us a gift. And what she did is that she left this on behalf of the congregation of Jordan Harbor, and it was something that was done by Creative Spirits, which at the present time subsidized by the Niagara Presbytery. And it's a it's it's a nice piece of art. So she left us this picture, which I'll give to Roy to put up in the gallery. Okay. As well as she brought us some prayer stones. And this is something else that the creative spirits did. I don't have big hands, so bear with me. But basically they painted the prayer stones equivalent to grocery beads. And she left us with three of these, so anyways. These would be a little bit heavy to carry in your pocket, but if you wanted to do a smaller one, you could. So. Just don't throw them. <laughs> okay. Remember that uh, Sue McLeod would be glad to receive your $25 for an Observer subscription. Right? <laughs> What's that? It ends today. Oh, it ends today. You'll have to go to the internet and get it for twice the price if you miss today. Anyway. Anything more on the prayer shawl ministry than uh, that we're dedicating some more? And that is uh, really taking off. The people that are receiving them are thrilled to have them. So we thank those who are involved in the prayer shawl ministry. Um, 
Any update on the, the mission last week? The money that was made? $315. And you'll note that mission <laughs> Muffins for Mission is happening again on the 11th of February. Now, oh, we should mention that the uh, session is meeting on Tuesday morning. Anything else that needs to come before the congregation? Okay. Yeah. Let's join in singing hymn number 410, This Day God Gives Me. And you just 
run around in the grass? Is that the idea? Sometimes that's all that happens. It's all. <laughs> My daughter used to play soccer, but if the ball came to her, she ran in the other direction. <laughs> that was when they played flop soccer. They kicked the ball to her, and the, everyone on the field would be coming towards her. And she didn't like that, so she'd run away. She doesn't play soccer anymore. <laughs> Anyway, what are you supposed to try and do? Were you a striker? Midfield. Midfield. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bill played very high levels of soccer. That's why I asked him about his soccer career. But the, the goal is to score goals. But there's a time when something more important than goals and ball possession and that happens in soccer games. Like, and I don't know if, if Bill did this, but when my son was playing and someone got injured and you had possession of the ball, you'd kick it out so the play could stop and they could deal with whatever injuries were, were involved. And that's pretty good. Because if one of the opponent, opponent's players got injured, you'd have an advantage. You'd have the ball and fewer people to deal with, and you could go down and score. But that wasn't seen to be a very nice thing to do and a very sporting thing to do. So sometimes there are more important things than scoring goals or winning games. And people are more important. So I want it. See that? That's placed for a corner kick. A lot of goals are scored off of corner kicks. But it's more important to live and play the game well with other people in mind. Okay? Let's bow together in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you that you place us in families and among friends. And that you call us to be concerned for them and their well-being. We thank you for those who gather around us, who feed us and love us in our homes. And we thank you that you have made the world this way, and that we can be part of your plan for us. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. The first reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 13. Food offered to idols. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. But anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do.
but take care of this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their failing, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. And the second reading is Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. <clears throat> the man with an unclean spirit. When they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, they entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the very word of God. Bert liked getting out, especially to go to hockey games. So we went together. But leaving his home for just about any reason posed a dilemma for Bert. The games we went to were not professional. They were not even junior A games. The players were local tier two juniors. Had these games been professional, you could probably buy a beer or even have one delivered to your seat. And at Junior A games, there is often a designated area serving as a beer garden. You have to get it yourself, but you can still get it. But at these games, there was no alcohol served. Bert's dilemma was that he loved to drink. By the end of a whole game without a drink, he would start to visibly shake. It was good for Bert to go without booze for the three or more hours a hockey game would keep him from his home. He didn't see it that way. In every room of his place, there was a little something to feed his addiction. The kitchen was well stocked. I knew of a small bottle he kept under the sofa in the living room and of another in the medicine cabinet of his bathroom, and I'm sure there were other stashes. Bert never had to go too far or wait very long for his next drink, especially when he was at home. So people invited him out to hockey games and to church dinners and other activities where Bert would have little or no access to his liquid nemesis. You might think that there was a conspiracy to keep him from drinking, and you'd be right. He had already lost a job, a large house, a car, his driver's license, and other things through issues related to his alcohol abuse. I would later come to believe research that would link his wife's death to his addiction too. 
Jean had died in her 40s due to cancer, and in a short span of time, I presided at six such funerals of women in their 40s who had been married to alcoholics. The theory is that stress will keep white blood cells from doing their job in our bodies. Spouses of addicts are uniquely stressed. I am still convinced that the stresses endured by these women contributed to their early deaths. Those who were concerned for Bert sought to get him away from home as much as possible. The activities would keep him away from his bottles. In some ways, it's amazing that he kept accepting invitations. A different angle on the same addiction. When I was training for military chaplaincy, one of my colleagues was named Dan. He didn't drink, but he didn't mind if others did. So he offered himself as what would later be known as a designated driver. When we went out and there was drinking, he offered to drive so that everyone would get home safely. <clears throat> Alcohol had been a problem in Dan's family home. Both of his parents had addiction problems. From his own research, he discovered that someone with two alcoholic parents, like himself, had about a 90% chance of having his or her own problem. Dan chose not to find out for himself if he had that problem, so he chose not to drink at all. Dan was the most interested participant when part of our training as chaplains included a tour of the Canadian Forces Detox Center in British Columbia. Now, I don't want to pick on people for their addiction today, but alcohol is one of those things that most folks can use responsibly. Most of us can take it or leave it. Responsible use is legal in our country, and in the Bible, St. Paul even recommends wine as an aid in digestion or a remedy for a stomach ailment. So we have a right to use it. But there is a minority of people around us, like Bert and like Dan's parents, for whom alcohol is a problem and a dilemma. This is a place they dare not go. For them, alcohol leaves a trail of destruction, lost jobs, lost privileges, lost houses, lost cars, lost families, lost spouses, and sometimes lost lives. <coughs> our passage from Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth tells us our responsibilities in light of other people's weaknesses. The issue raised by the faith community at Corinth for Paul's consideration was not alcohol, but food that had been sacrificed to idols. Most worship involving sacrifices of offerings ends with the consumption of those offerings. Many of the offerings sacrificed in Jewish temple worship were eventually consumed, either by priests or others at the temple, and the temple would sometimes smell like a barbecue. Some offerings were reserved for the poor or the ill. At Corinth, there was a variety of temples and various worship practices. Some of the pagan practices ended in a feast open to all comers, whether they practiced the religion of the temple or not. The food was free to all and came with no strings attached. So the question was, could the good Christians of Corinth partake of such food if it were given to them? Paul's answer was a definite maybe. On one hand, Paul suggests that what we eat is of little concern to God. From the spiritual perspective, God is neither going to be excited nor offended by what you put in your mouths. In other words, eat what you like. There is even a departure here from the kosher dietary laws customary in Judaism. But, and this is a big but, Christians are not only responsible to God for their actions, but to each other as well. 
So eating would not be a sin against God, but the same activity could be a sin against fellow humans. So beware. This twofold approach to sin was not new. In Judaism and in Christianity, the Ten Commandments, for instance, are often depicted as being on two tablets. However one determines the commandments themselves, and there are about three ways to do so, one of the tablets contains the commandments pertaining to God, while the other contains the commandments that pertain to other humans, whether in family or beyond in community. So on one hand, the Corinthians are perfectly within their rights to eat food which has been sacrificed to idols. But Paul goes on to say, be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. You might know what you are doing, and you might be okay with it. But a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. If your activity causes people without this knowledge to go astray, you are responsible for how your action affects their weakness. To extend this concept to our sisters and brothers for whom alcohol is a weakness. We may well be within our rights to consume beer or wine or booze in moderate amounts, both legally and spiritually. But to do so in the company of someone for whom alcohol is a problem would be irresponsible. In our Gospel lesson today, we are reminded that Jesus taught with authority, and he healed with authority. But Jesus went out of his way to use that authority for the benefit of those who were infirm in body and mind and spirit. Jesus healed completely of body and mind and spirit. And yet he set aside his rightful place so that he could heal our afflictions and make us whole again. The Holy One of God, as he's referred to in the Gospel lesson, exercised those things which were impure from an afflicted man, that the way might be clear for him to return to health. We are challenged to do likewise. We must exercise anything within us which would lead us or anyone else astray, and like Jesus, we must set aside our rights and our rightful place for the sake of others. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's now receive our morning offerings.
Gracious God, as we come before you, we, we remember the love with which you treat humankind. You have come in the Word made flesh. You have taken on our humanity to show us what true humanity is. You have gifted us richly and with a portion of what we ourselves have been given. You call us out of ourselves into ministry. We pray that you would bless what we bring before you today, ourselves, our souls, and our offerings. We dedicate them afresh to your Son and our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. We have a few uh, prayer requests here for Catherine and for Bob. And uh, perhaps some will remember a young woman who uh, came to church a couple of months ago, perhaps, that my wife knew from camp years ago. Um, we found that she's been diagnosed with breast cancer, so we're going to pray for her. Also for the uh, new ministry beginning here. Are there any other prayer requests? Oh, your sister, Dorothy, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's approach God in prayer. Hear my prayer, O oh God, hear my prayer, Gracious God, as we do come before you today, we know of your concern for the world and its peoples. And as we continue to consider Christian unity around the globe, we continue in prayer, especially for Christians who are at risk, who are dispossessed, who are displaced. So we pray for your church near and far, and as we offer our prayers, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had in this area to share in ministry collegially. And so we continue in prayer for Jordan Station United Church, and especially for Anita Spiller. We come before you knowing of your love for your people. And so we share our concerns as well for those who need your intervention in their lives. We come before you to pray for Catherine and for Bob and for Dorothy. We pray for them in their various circumstances knowing that you are willing to offer a healing hand and comfort. We pray that we too might be sources of comfort and healing. Lord, as we come before you, we thank you too for new beginnings. And we look forward to welcoming Bill Thomas into our midst. We pray that this might be a time of things that we might not even have dreamed of. And we pray that all of us would 
not only make Bill welcome, but help him in his task. Lord, as we come before you, thinking of various people and events, we come with open hearts. We think of others whose names we do not share. We think of circumstances that we don't speak audibly. But you are always ready to receive our prayers, those that are offered in the silence of our hearts. And so we ask you to plumb the depths of our hearts by your spirit and meet the prayers that we house there. Lord, hear our prayers and in your love answer. And Lord, as we thank you for new beginnings, we thank you too for a special grandson, Reed, a little brother for Isla, and we thank you for the blessings of family and home life. Amen. Thy holy wings, O Savior, spread gently over me, and let me rest securely through the land in thee. O be my strength and portion, my rock and hiding place, and Our closing hymn is number 509, I the Lord of Sea and Sky. Bye. Uh -huh.
calls his own. And as we go from here, let us go in peace, a peace that the world won't give, but needs desperately. And so let us go to be emissaries of peace, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.